Omagyanta Mirandasya, Gidajana Salakaya, Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurvena Maha, Sri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa, Kidam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam, Vande Ham Shiguro Shi Yuta Padikamalam Shigurun Vaishnavam Scha, Sri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaganad Raganatam Bitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sihitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Bitam Scha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneswari Vrishabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Adi Priye Vanchakalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Vaevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pasyatya De Satarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Ha. Um, I was supposed to give Chaitanya Charitamrita class this morning. That's what uh, Ananta said. But this is Srimad Bhagavatam. Do you uh, know where that book is for CC? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Which one are you doing? Mm. Okay. Let's see what, what chapters are here. This is this is not readable by me. <laughs> Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vinda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vinda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vindham Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vindham Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Ram. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Hare Ram, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ki jai, Shri Panchatattva ki jai. Hmm, which verse? 
I thought it was, I was thinking the devotees followed a series of verses, but guess not. Okay, let's see. Mm -hmm. So I'll read something instructive, <clears throat> maybe. <clears throat> Then, this is from the talks of <coughs> Lord Chaitanya and Ramananda Roy. <coughs> so I'll read a little bit and then we'll comment on some of it. This is Lord Chaitanya on the request of uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, <clears throat> was was asked to meet Ramananda Roy in a place called Kabur, uh, near the banks of the Godavari River. And uh, so now they meet, and now Ramananda Roy approaches Lord Chaitanya and offers his respectful obeisances, and the Lord embraced him. And then they began to discuss Krishna in a, a secluded place. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ordered Ramananda Roy, recite a verse from the revealed scripture concerning the ultimate goal of life. Ramananda replied, if one executes the prescribed duty of his social position, he awakens his original Krishna consciousness. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is worshipped by the proper execution of prescribed duties in the system of Varna and Ashram. <clears throat> there is no way to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One must be situated in the institution in, of Varna and Ashram. The Lord replied, that is external. You had better tell me of some other means. Ramananda replied, to offer the results of one's activities to Krishna is the essence of all perfection. Ramananda Roy continued, My dear son of Kunti, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer in sacrifice, whatever you give in charity, and whatever austerities you perform, all the results of such activities should be offered to me, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Lord Chaitanya replied, this is also external. Please proceed and speak further on this matter. <clears throat> Ramananda replied, <clears throat> to give up one's occupational duties in the Vanashram system is the essence of perfection. Ramananda explains, occupational duties, he quotes a verse, are described in the religious scriptures. If one analyzes them, he can fully understand their qualities and faults, and then give them up and completely, completely to render service to the Supreme Personality of the Godhead. Such a person is a first-class person. And then, after giving up all kinds of religious occupations, if you come to me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, to take shelter, I will give you protection from all life's sinful activities, do not fear. After hearing Ramananda Roy speak in this way, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again rejected this statement and said, go ahead and say something more. Ramananda Roy then replied, devotional service mixed with empiric knowledge is the essence of perfection. Ramananda Roy continued, according to the Bhagavad Gita, one who is transcendentally situated at once realizes the Supreme Bhav, Brahman, and becomes fully joyful. He never laments or desires to have anything. He is equally disposed to all living entities, and in that state he attains pure devotional service after, unto me. After, the, after hearing this, the Lord, as usual, rejected it, <laughs> considered it to be external devotional service. He again asked Ramananda Roy to speak further, and Ramananda replied, Pure devotional service 
Without any touch of speculative knowledge is the essence of perfection. And then he said, Lord Brahm, he quoted a verse, Jane prayasam upasya namanta evam jivanti sam mukaritam bhavabhidi avardam stane sthitam sutikatam tanam nu vano mano beer yad prayasa jita jito pyasi twice trilogyam. Ramananda replied, quoting this verse, My dear Lord, those, dos, those devotees who have thrown away the impersonal conception of the Absolute Truth and have therefore been in discussing empirical philosophical truth should hear from self-realized devotees about your holy name, form, pastimes, and qualities. They should completely follow the principles of devotional service and remain free from illicit sex, gambling, intoxication, and animal slaughter. Surrendering themselves fully with body, words, and mind, they can live in any ashram or social status. Indeed, you are conquered by such persons, although you are always unconquerable. At this point, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu replied, This is all right, but still you can speak more on this subject. Ramananda replied then, Ecstatic love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the essence of perfection. Ramananda Roy continued, as long as there hunger and thirst within the stomach, varieties in food and drink make one feel happy. Similarly, when the Lord is worshipped with pure love, the various activities performed in the course of that worship awaken transcendental bliss in the heart of the devotees. Hearing up to the, to the point of spontaneous love, the Lord said, This is all right, but if you know more, please tell me. <laughs> Ramananda replied, Spontaneous loving service and servitude as exchanged by master and servant is the highest perfection. A person becomes pu simply purified by hearing the holy name of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. His lotus feet create the holy places of pilgrimage. Therefore, what remains to be attained by those who have become his servants? By serving you constantly, one is freed from all material desires and is completely pacified. When shall I engage as your permanent eternal service and always be servant and always be fully joyful to have such a perfect master? So this is a verse quoted by Jamunacharya from the Stotra Hearing this from the Ramananda Roy, the Lord again requested him to go a step further. In reply, Ramananda Roy said, Loving service to Krishna rendered in fraternity is the highest perfection. <clears throat> Neither those engaged in self-realization or appreciating the Brahman effulgence of the Lord nor those engaged in devotional service while accepting the Supreme Personality of Godhead as Master, nor those under the clutches of Maya thinking the Lord as an ordinary person, can understand that certain exalted personalities, after accumulating volumes of pious activities, are now playing with the Lord in friendship as a cowherd voice. This is a statement made by Sukadeva Goswami, who appreciated the good fortune of the cowherd boys who played with Krishna and ate with him on the banks of the Jamuna. The Lord said, this statement is very good, but please proceed even further. Ramananda Roy then applied, loving service to the Lord in parental affection is the highest perfectional stage. And then he continued, O Brahman, O Brahmana, what pious activities did Nanda Maharaj perform by which he received the Supreme Personality of God at Krishna as his son? And what pious activities did Mother Yasoda perform that made her the absolute truth, Personality of Godhead Krishna, call her mother and suck her breast? The favor Mother Yasoda obtained from Sri Krishna, the bestower of liberation, was never obtained even by Lord Brahma or Lord Shiva nor even by the goddess of fortune, who always remains on the chest of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And this is a statement from Srimad Bhagavatam. The Lord said, 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, your statements are certainly getting better and better, one after another, but surpassing all of them, is there another transcendental mellow you can speak of as the most sublime? Ramananda Roy replied, conjugal attachment to Krishna is the topmost position in love of Godhead. When Lord Sri Krishna was dancing with the gopis in the Rasa Lila, the gopis were embraced around the neck by the Lord's arms. These transcendental favor was never bestowed upon the goddess of fortune or any other consorts in the spiritual world, nor was such a thing ever imagined even by the most beautiful girls in the heavenly planets, girls with bodily luster and aroma resembling the beauty and fragrance of lotus flowers. What to speak of worldly women who may be very, very beautiful according to material estimations. This verse was spoken by Uddhava. Hmm. Suddenly, due to their feelings of separation, Lord Krishna appeared among the gopis dressed in yellow garments and wearing a flower gold, and his lotus face was smiling. He was directly attracting the mind of Cupid. This is a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam also. There are various means and processes by which one can attain the favor of Krishna. All those transcendental processes will be studied from the viewpoint of comparative importance. It is true that whatever relationship a particular devotee has with the Lord is the best for him. Still, when we study all the different methods from the neutral position, we can understand there are higher and lower degrees of love. Increasing love is experience in various tastes one above the other. But that love which is the highest in the gradual succession of the desires manifests itself in the form of conjugal love. Hmm. This is the gradual order of improvement in transcendental mellows from the initial ones to the later ones. In each subsequent mellow, the qualities of the previous mellows are manifested, counting from two, then three, and up to the point of five complete qualities. As the qualities increase, so do the tastes also increase in each mellow. Therefore, the qualities found in Shantaras, Dashiras, Sakiras, and Vatsayaras are all manifested in conjugal love, Madhurya Ras. <laughs> and here's an, here's an analogy. The qualities of the material elements, sky, air, fire, water, and earth, increase one after another by gradual process of one, two, three, and at the last stage, in the element earth, all five qualities are completely visible. Complete attainment of the lotus feet of Sri Krishna is made possible by love of God, specifically Madhurya Ras, or conjugal love. Lord Krishna is indeed captivated by this standard of love. This is, this is stated in Bhagavad Gita. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, this is stated in Bhagavatam. And then it goes higher and higher, and then it goes to Gopi's love for Krishna. And then once it goes higher, then it goes into Srimati Radharani's love for Krishna, which is the sinister of all perfection. And then Ramananda, then Krishna, then Ramananda, <laughs> and then, then Lord Chaitanya says to, says to uh, Ramananda Roy, after he describes Radharani love, he says, is there something else? <laughs> and and Ramananda Roy says, no one has ever acquired beyond this point. <laughs> and then he starts uh, describing the, the qualities of Krishna. Um, so even higher are the qualities of Krishna. <laughs> so there's two things you can never understand in devotional service. No one can understand. There's only one... To three people in existence. Radharani, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and Madhavendra Puri. These only these three can understand. Well, even Radha, even Madhavendra Puri can't understand. <laughs> Radharani's love for Krishna and Krishna's qualities. These things are not understandable by anyone. 
Even Radharani can't even understand Krishna's qualities. <laughs> and even Krishna can't understand Radharani's love. It's not possible. Both are beyond any mortal or even any anybody, even in a spiritual world, to understand. It's just... So the, these things are never understandable. They're unlimitedly expanding more and more. The more you describe Krishna's qualities and the more you describe the qualities that are connected with those qualities and there's more qualities that are connected with those qualities. And, and it just goes on and on and on and on. Just like it says in the Nectar of Devotion, Krishna has 64 transcendental qualities. But that's just the basic ones. From each one of them, there expands unlimited more and more qualities. And the living entity, we, we have 50 of the 64 qualities of Krishna in minute quantity. As a drop in relationship to the whole is never at the same level as the whole. It's still, but it has the same liquidity as the ocean. So in the same way, the living entity has 50 of Krishna's qualities in small quantity, like that. And those are part of the soul's existence. And so material qualities are just expansions, or what we say, shadow reflections of the real qualities of the soul. <clears throat> and any material quality is also subject to change. Whereas spiritual qualities are dynamic and they're only expanding, they don't change. So a person may be very kind by nature, but if they were put into a difficult situation, they might find that their kindness is gone. <laughs> so a circumstance in the material world will deter a person. Therefore, in the Bhagavatam it says that in the material world, nobody has any good qualities. Why? Because they're all created by the interaction of the three modes of material and energy. And as the modes shift, so these qualities also shift. In other words, they don't have foundation in anything eternal. And therefore, they're temporary. And because they're temporary, they also can disappear under different circumstances. Mm-hmm. But transcendental qualities are also are part of the soul's existence, and they they are, are they are eternal. So there is spiritual kindness, and just like we have the example of Arjun on the battlefield. Now he started to speak in a material way about kindness towards the opposite party, which were his friends, relatives, gurus martial teachers, people who he grew up with, people who he had a lot of relationships and even, and even affection for. And then he starts speaking, you know, how can we enjoy the kingdom in, uh, uh, at the expense of such personalities? In other words, we have to kill them and, and then we win the kingdom. So how can we enjoy at the expense of people we love? <laughs> and uh, Prabhupada talks about that in the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where Arjuna had a soft heart. So these are, he says these are the indications of a devotee who has a soft heart. But then Krishna told him, Asocham man vasocham stva pachyavaram chivasase that you're speaking nice words, but I must consider you a fool. <laughs> because you're on the material platform. And therefore, you have a duty to fight on religious principles. That's devotional service. You're comparing material perfection with devotional service, and therefore there is no question of comparison. Because everything in the material world is bad. <laughs> There's nothing good in the material world. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> yeah, because it takes you away from Krishna. 
That's why it's bad. <laughs> Even the nicest, so-called nicest example of happiness that may, one may experience in a material world is bad because it's contrary to your nature as a spiritual being. Therefore, it takes you away from Krishna. <laughs> Sometimes even bad qualities in the material world are better than the good qualities in the material world because they, they force you to change <laughs> and maybe become devotees, hopefully. But material good qualities, and this is a verse, but it's in the uh, fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavan. Well, what is it? Yasyasti bhakti bhagavati akinchana gunar savastate surasama harava bhakto kuto mana guna mano ratena sati dayato bahi. Yeah, so that verse is spoken by. Uh, <clears throat> by Prahlad Maharaj, I believe, or one of the residents of Jambudweep, describing that one who engages in devotional service has all the good qualities of the demigods, such as knowledge, renunciation, and one more, three they mentioned, knowledge, renunciation, and devotion. And But one who... Uh, even if one sees good qualities in another in a materialist, such as mystic power or expertise in maintaining family, one should see that these are not good qualities because they're under the influence of the three modes of material nature, and therefore they are temporary. So the Shastras make a dis distinction between what is temporary and what is eternal. So something may be apparently good, for something temporary, but that's time, place, and circumstance. You know. So just like Arjuna, he he had good qualities, but it was misplaced. It's misplaced because Krishna said, you know, you're my instrument for bringing about Dharma in the world. So that is perfection for you and for everyone else. And if you don't act on your own dharma and you act on material principles of goodness, and then he called him a fool. <laughs> he wasn't so nice about it. Krishna told him, you're a fool. <laughs> and then Arjuna was shocked and then Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita. And what is the first thing he says? The tvevam jatunasam, the tvam neme janadipa, the chaivam bhavishyama sarve vidaparam param. Never was a time that I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the futures, and any was ceased to be. Dehino smin yata dehe kovaram yovaram jara tata de hantara praktir, diras tara de muyanti. The embodied soul passes from boyhood to youth to old age. Uh, the self-realized soul is not disturbed by such a change. Marta sparses to kuntaya satnosa sukadukada agapayino nitya tamste tiksua bharata. The non-appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in their due course of time are like the appearance of winter and summer. So it's winter now. So we're cold. And we look at Janava, she's all bundled up. We can't even see her. She's got so much clothes on. <laughs> she's, the Italians, they like warm weather, and the Slovenians, they like cold weather. <laughs> so, you know, you know Somadachi's there just relaxing. You know. she, would, she would put her bathing suit on, but it, would, it wouldn't be appropriate in, in public, you know. <laughs> She likes cold weather. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's the, uh, you know, that's the culture here. It's, you know, it's a cold climate and people seem to like cold weather. <laughs> I'm always fighting with my thermostat. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so, uh, so the happiness and distress come like the changings of the seasons. So now it's, you know, and after a while, you know, it'll be hot and Janava will be smiling and Somadratri Dhatri will be crying. And, oh, it's too hot. 
पंच तत्व की जाए या सो इट्स इज द चेंजिंग ऑफ द सीजन्स गिव यू डिफरेंट परसेप्शंस बट इट्स ऑल इट्स ऑल बेस्ड ऑन द एक्सटर्नल बॉडी और द स्किन other words how the skin feels that considers happiness and distress like that so we call that skin disease <laughs> and that means identifying what happens to you by based on what happens to the body what happens to the body doesn't happen to you and if you could remember that then at the time of death there will be no problem because then you can leave the body say oh well i'm not the body i'm just getting rid of this piece of you know bag it's a big bag <laughs> it's got a lot of things inside too <laughs> certain ingredients you don't want to talk about <laughs> but you you are eternal and so krishna spends how many verses 20 verses at least just talking about the difference between what is temporary and what is eternal what is uh, material and what is spiritual and just to set the foundation for arjuna to understand higher knowledge because it's explained and unless one understands i am not this body at least that much even if you don't know who you are well if you know you who you're not if you know you're not the body you can understand krishna consciousness and make progress but if we still think i'm the body and we may act on the bodily level and we have to do that because we have to take care of the body but we should know we're taking care of a vehicle that i am inside of that's all <laughs> it's me who's inside of this that's why probably you used to say why is the body so dear to all living beings why because i'm inside <laughs> if someone comes and starts you know hitting your car with a hammer you think hey what are you doing that's my car it's not you but still it's your car you, you need it and you you know why you want to keep it in good shape so in the same way we want to keep the body in good shape but it's not us <laughs> and how you to minimize bodily needs is actually the uh, success in krishna consciousness to keep things at a minimum or what is actually necessary to keep body and soul together because if you eat too much then you'll sleep too much if you eat too little the mind is hard to control the mind will, will be you know running this way and that way so therefore krishna says in the bhagavad gita and he makes the point in the 6th chapter one should not eat too much or too little sleep too much or sleep too little so he talks about bodily concerns but as a foundation for the execution of devotional service not simply to uh, you know talk about you know uh something material or something from a health point of view it's all about foundationalizing our spiritual practice that's the importance like that so um yeah so real real knowledge or truth means to understand who i am as a spirit soul part and parcel of krishna and how that relationship plays itself out and what is the goal of that relationship the goal of the relationship is not to keep warm in the winter time that's not the goal <laughs> the goal of the relationship is to develop love for krishna <laughs> there's no second uh uh what we say goal there are intermediate goals that lead to the big goal just like well i want to learn the scriptures that's important so you make that a goal so that helps you to understand krishna and how to execute devotional service so that's an intermediate goal which will help you lead to the ultimate goal which is love of god 
I want to chant nice rounds free from offenses. That's an intermediate goal which leads to a higher goal, love of Krishna. <laughs> so we make these different, inter and this is also recommended, <clears throat> one should make intermediate goals in the process of making the ultimate goal. And if you don't have any goals in your devotional service, you really don't, you're not really directed in, in a very clear way. So for example, one of the goals is, I want to perfect my chanting. So let me do everything I can to understand what, it need, what I need in order to perfect my chanting and let me practice perfected chanting. So that is a, that's, a, that's a goal. And then you work on that. I put the guys to sleep here. Everybody's... They don't like my jokes anyway. We tell jokes to keep people awake. That's one of, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> if you want to get people to wake up, you just tell a joke, you know. <laughs> But my jokes don't go over so good, so they don't. They they just go deeper into the sleep state. <laughs> but that works in in a lot of places. So. <laughs> I just don't know any Slovenian. I can't speak Slovenian jokes. <laughs> so, so. Maybe if you give me a few more years. <laughs> but that works. And uh, telling jokes is also really good preaching <clears throat> because what it does, as soon as you start laughing, you're, you're, you're wide open for the next statement. <laughs> so that what I mean is just like you're laughing and then I say, Surrender. <laughs> you use that on book distribution, right? You get them to relax and then you hit them hard. Boom. Yeah. And then they're all ready to, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so laughter is a, is, a, is a tool to use for preaching. It is. It's actually a preaching tool. So we use that <clears throat> to it gets the attention, and at the same time you're ready for the next shot. <laughs> and Prabhupada was really funny. He was he listened to Prabhupada. Some of the, he's, he sometimes he makes fun of devotees chanting. He said it's not like not like that. <laughs> So he makes fun of devotees how they chant, because <laughs> you know even in, you know we used to chant, and uh, we wouldn't even pronounce the the words clearly or completely. Sometimes just even shortcutting the mantra or garbling the mantra. So there was a devotee. He started a whole process of exper of exposing the devotees to their own bad chanting. <laughs> So he, put, he used to put tape recorders next to the devotees when they were chanting. And then he'd say, here, play it back. You can listen to how you chant. <laughs> and so that helps you see where you need to, to uh, you know, work on like that. So um, back to the essence of here. This is, um, so it goes higher and higher. Love of God is not simply a stage you reach. It's a stage that leads to higher and higher realizations of that stage. There are eight stages in love of God, and each are symptomatic of certain qualities. So the higher you go, these, statement, these stages of <coughs> ecstasy manifest themselves in different ways like that. And that's mentioned in also in Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's mentioned also in some of the works of the Goswamis, especially in Bhaktivinoda, of course, Jaiva Dharma. 
So it's nice to know how the process works, all the details of the process, because we read certain verses. Now when we read these verses in context to what they are being explained on, they seem to be very important. But in the, in a larger sense, Lord Chaitanya said, Io baje. That means they're external. Now, yad karosi yadanasi yad jahosi dadasi yad tapasi tukunti yad kudusho marapanam. He said that's external. <laughs> all that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away, and all the sacrifices you perform should be done as an offering to me. He said that that's what the grihasters are meant to do in order to get a foothold in devotional service. That's what Billy it is. So there's a lot of foothold verses. Verses or principles that we that are being taught to help you get to the point of Krishna consciousness. Real Krishna consciousness is Yabila Sita Sunya Gyana Karmana Avritam Anukulena Krishna Silanam Bhakti Uttamam. You know that verse? Yeah. That's Rupa Goswami's verse describing what is pure devotional service. That is, the devotional service is uh, for Krishna, with a desire to please Krishna, free from any personal desires for karma and jnana. <clears throat> Now, there are persons who please Krishna who don't have an intention to please Krishna. You can do things that pleases Krishna, but it could be done, what we say, unconsciously or with another motive. <clears throat> and that is not pure devotional service. That's why Rupa Goswami clearly makes the point that you have to intend to please Krishna. Then you, and when you please Krishna, when you intend to please Krishna, that is complete, proper consciousness. So, for example, the demons please Krishna, but they don't try to please Krishna. <laughs> so Krishna kills them, and, you know, that pleases Krishna, and it's good for them, but they don't get bhakti, they get maybe sahuja mukti at the best. So this verse from Rupa Goswami's introduction to Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu is the foundation by which we can understand what is pure devotional service. Try to please Krishna by intending to please Krishna. <laughs> so what pleases Krishna? Well, Krishna is a person and there's things that do please him. <clears throat> And there are certain activities that please him, and there's and there is a, there's a mood that really pleases him. The intention to please him is the mood that he that pleases him, even if the activity is what we say uh, very simple. For instance, maybe just you know washing the floor or something. <clears throat> But preaching Krishna consciousness, that activity pleases Krishna. Because he can, he comes to rescue the conditioned souls. So if you're assisting him in that mission, that pleases Krishna. Simply by that activity alone. And when you intend, when you do it as a means to please, then it's perfect like that. Okay, so the idea is to please Krishna. Prabhupada said nobody wants to please Krishna, everyone wants to please themselves. <laughs> That's the material world. Something for me and something for Krishna. That's, that's all right in the beginning, but then that has to gradually reduce where one will just be thinking, whatever it takes to please Krishna, that's... That's my focus, <laughs> yeah, like that. And we learn how to please Krishna by learning, hearing from Srila Prabhupada. So it's important regularly to hear from Prabhupada so we get an understanding of what is pleasing to Krishna and how to, and how to make it pleasing, what it is and how to do it, like that. So Prabhupada is very <clears throat> clear. And Prabhupada also, 
explains what pleases him. So what pleases him also pleases Krishna. Because the pure devotee is there to simply offer our devotional service to Krishna. And with whatever he offers, because he is in, in the consciousness of pure devotion, everything is being accepted by Krishna through the pure devotee. Okay, so these are some things we can think about. Any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Yes, Prabhu. What is your name? Sadbuja Das. Oh, Sadbuj, right. Yeah, okay. Thank you, now I remember. About that point that we need to know how parts work, process work. Uh, like example, if we don't chant, if devotee don't chant of uh, Namabas level, uh, is it possible for him to be success at the end of life? If he's only up to Nama Bas? Yeah, just Nama Parad level of chanting, like example. Is it possible for him? I think uh, in that mood uh, he don't engage to know how process work. He just try to give his best and uh, practicing is his own way, this and that, but uh, no Nama Bas. Level, no understanding Nama how process works. will give you liberation. <clears throat> It'll give you liberation, but it won't get you love of God. Mm -hmm. Only pseudonym gets you love of God. <clears throat> even, if, even if he doesn't know the process, <clears throat> at the end of life he'll achieve some, some stage of liberation. Heavenly plants? Not necessarily. That's not never. That's that's material world. There is uh, maybe going on the same planet with Krishna, or having the same form as Krishna, or having the same opulences as Krishna. There are five forms of liberation. These are bhakti liberations. So namabas. There's two types of namabas. There's pati pati bimba and chaya. There's two kinds. Do you know the difference between those two? Patibimba and Chaya, Namabas? No. Janava? No? Yeah. Chaya means shadow. <clears throat> and Patibimba is more like what the Maya bodies, the Maya bodies can achieve some, some, some form of Patibimba. But I'm not sure what it is. It's explained. Yeah, so they can get, you can get liberation, but they can't get love of God. Oh. You have to have pseudonym for love of, love of God. Uh, thank you. I would like to ask uh, one more thing that is not related exactly to the point for today. Could I? Yeah. Uh, I discussed with friends, uh, devotees of mine, friends of mine about Shukadeva Goswami uh, why he is example and why he was uh, uh, impersonalist in, 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 in case that he, he, he is liberated person but uh, he didn't uh, have connection with Krishna well he, <clears throat> he was impersonal but then when he heard from his father who was speaking to his mother, he was narrating the Srimad Bhagavan. He, when he came out, he was he was a personalist. Before then, when he was in the womb, he was an impersonalist. When he was in the womb, he was impersonalist. It says that only when he heard from his father, which was Vyasadeva, Vyasadeva was his father, then he got enlightened, so he stayed in the womb hearing from his father for 16 years. But argument was like example that like uh, parrot she heard from Shiva, Lord Shiva, and after yeah. that she heard one more time from 
Um, right. Yeah. And that's that's preliminary to his birth. That uh, the parrot. It's interesting because there are controversial statements about who Sukadev Goswami is. Some people say he's she he's Radharani's parrot, and others say he's not. So um, I'm under the under the impression he is Radharani's parrot. Only because during the narration of uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam to Maharaj Pariksit, he didn't mention Radharani's name. And it's mentioned, why, the reason why he didn't mention Radharani's name is because if he did, he would have went into ecstasy. And there he couldn't, therefore he couldn't perform his service of narrating the Bhagavatam. And another reason was that the people who were there listening weren't qualified to hear about Radharani. Mm -hmm. hmm? Yeah, there were many great sages and saints. They were tapasyas, yogis, various persons. Um, high on the spiritual platform, but not in the mood of Vrindavan. So, uh, just to finish point, uh, as he heard two times Srimad Bhagavatam like parrot, uh, how is it possible for him to be impersonalist again? Th that was a yeah, little discussion. You have to check with higher authorities. <laughs> I can't give you that answer, because I've always been struggling with that also, and uh, I haven't found any statements to, to, qual to, uh, to somehow qualify that. It's good research. Do some research. <laughs> it's there, or you can somehow. Or you might also say maybe he manifested himself in two different forms, or two different times. One time as a devotee, one time as an impersonalist. That could also be there. So that hearing from Lord Shiva <clears throat> was, uh, you know, one of the times. It doesn't mean it happened every time that he came. <laughs> That sometimes we, because we also know Hanuman comes many times in different forms, or different times, under different circumstances he appears. Mm -hmm. And so that's a possible answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's philosophical speculation. Yes, Udo. Hare Krishna, thank you very much again for a very nice lecture. So regarding um, the motive with, uh, with whom you do the service, like if you do the service like uh, with the motive to purify oneself, this is also for Krishna? Mm. Or more for... It's one, more for you. Yeah. Even though if you want to, to raise yeah, Krishna consciousness with that. Yeah, it's, it's more for you. Because... Mm, um, the gopis, when they were asked to give the dust of their lotus feet on uh, the head of Krishna, they immediately did it. Narada Muni informed them that, uh, you know, you're going to go to hell for this. They said, we don't care. <laughs> we'll go to hell forever if it pleases Krishna. So the highest principle is not to think in terms of what you're getting. But what you're giving completely. So what we know, engaging in devotional service will purify automatically. But if using that as the motivation, then it's less than pure. Mm -hmm. But when you serve, like if you want to satisfy Guru, this is the same, eh? like to satisfy... Yeah, satisfying Krishna. Guru and satisfy Krishna is non-different. Yasya, Yasya Devi, what is it, what is it? Yasya Prashada Bhagavad Prashado, Yasya Prashandan Nagati Gotopi. But how, how can you distinguish, for like, uh, there are many 
things for sure you know how to distinguish well when, i'll give you an example i'll give you an example i'll give you an example of your service you're out there distributing books if you really want to give these people books that's pleasing to krishna automatically <clears throat> because krishna wants these people to become krishna conscious so if you have a motivation to give them this transcendental knowledge that pleases krishna that alone is enough. <laughs> and, oh, what's the other example? Mm, I just had it. Yeah, and, and we know Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, you know, distribute my books. He made that because he got that instruction from his spiritual master. So Prabhupada made that his mission to distribute books. So that's high on the list of pleasing Prabhupada. So those who distribute books are obviously pleasing Krishna, pleasing Prabhupada. And that's a, that's a ticket back to Godhead. <laughs> If you do it your whole life. <laughs> yeah, but you can do like you can do also this service for your own sake. Yeah. You can, just to be number one in the money category. I, I, I made the I collected the most money, I col I made the, the most book points. Yeah, because there's always a competition. And if you think I wanna be number one, then that that motivation overshadows something else. That could be that could be a motivation, but it shouldn't be the main thing. Whether I'm one number one or not is nice, but what's more important is I want to, you know, give these conditioned souls an opportunity to become Krishna conscious. So I assume if you pray sincerely, if you at least try, want to serve uh, the Guru, then Krishna reveals if you have some hidden uh, wrong motives. Yeah. yeah. Like, <clears throat> I want prasad, because prasadam is Krishna. But give me pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I, uh, I understand that taking prasadam is honoring the Supreme Lord who has manifested himself in transcendental foodstuffs. Okay, and then whatever you get, get, then you should be satisfied with that. But if, and if you get choosy about what you get and what you don't get, then it, that comes down to a lesser platform. When Prabhupada was in his room, he was giving darshan every night. And uh, so they would, at the end of the darshan, they would bring the whole big maha plate, huge maha plate with so many varieties of foodstuffs. And so then Prabhupada would take a few bites of different things and then he would have it distributed. So when they were, the, the room was full with devotees, so the person distributed and sometimes they say, I want that, you know. So they would point to different things that they wanted. And Prabhupada noticed that. So one night he said, take it all and mix it all together. <laughs> So they, whatever it was, they made a merge out of it, you know, the sweet rice and the dal, you know. <laughs> and he said, now you can distribute. <laughs> he said, prashadam's absolute, you know. So. That's why if you take a little or you take a lot, it's the same. You take a lot, if you're in Maya, if you take a little, if you're not. <laughs> Does that help to clarify yeah, yeah, thank priorities? Yeah, thank you. If you're seeing something about yourself that is not pure devotional service, but it's, it's some kind of gain that you're looking for through your devotional service, then just push it to the background. Forget about it. And then Krishna will fulfill that auto, or automatically.
then it'll also be fulfilled. But as a as a benefit and not as a motivation. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Anything else? Sri Devi. Um, thank you, Guru Maharaj, for this class. Um, on this question of surrender to Krishna, how, <laughs> <laughs> how, do we, how do we actually really surrender? Because we may think we have surrendered and then we find we are not really so surrendered as we thought. Whatever you're asked to do, do it. And if something comes up, and you don't like it, then you're not surrendered. <laughs> I mean, if you don't like it, but you do it, you're surrendered. <laughs> so Krishna will see, all right, they're surrendered when everything is nice. But when things get a little bit, and Krishna will test you. He'll put you in a situation where you, you're required to do it, but it's you know something that you're kind of averse to. You don't. That's just to test you how surrendered you are. Because hmm. Krishna doesn't need the service, and he's not out to give you a hard time. <laughs> it's not his program. His program is to purify you from your attachments. That's all. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it's like that you know how to surrender you want to do it even you do it but eternally you can just not like at the end Krishna gives this surrender is it Chris, Krishna does what Krishna gives this um, final surrender yeah so he puts you in a situation where you you have to choose whether you want to surrender or not because at the time of death, you have to surrender everything. <laughs> He's getting you prepared for that moment. <laughs> That's what he, yeah, he's preparing you that ultimately when you're ready to leave the body, you should, there shouldn't be any attachments left. Otherwise, then, then uh, you have to come back again to fulfill that attachment. Prabhupada said, even if you're attached to one sweet ball, you have to take birth again. If you're attached to it, <clears throat> there, there's two kinds of people. And there's three. There's those who, <clears throat> who are attached to sense gratification and are engaged in devotional service. Those who are indifferent to sense gratification. Indifferent means if it comes, fine. If it doesn't come, doesn't matter. So they go on with their devotional service whether they get sense gratification or not. They don't, they're not, if they get it, fine. Like somebody will say, well, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> don't give me any sweets, but then it's somebody's birthday. <laughs> and they say, here is a piece of cake. They want you to have it. So you say, all right, okay. It's because of your birthday I'll eat it. <laughs> Just to please the person. And then there's other persons who are adverse to any kinds of sense of gratification. And you had the example of Sudama Brahma. Sudama Brahma was poor. And he, he enjoyed the idea of being poor. He had some pride in having nothing. And Krishna gave him everything just to break the pride. <laughs> yeah. He wanted to please him, but at the same time, he had that pride of being poor. <laughs> pride of renunciation. So there's that person... There's those who are indifferent. Well, yeah, I, if I have to fast, that's fine. If I have to take prasad, that's fine. 
Either way, they'll go along with the process, and they're not attached to sense gratification, or they're not attached to renunciation. They'll use whatever it comes in Krishna's service. So we call them indifferent. Yeah. Indifferent to sense gratification. And there's those who are adverse to sense gratification. They only want devotional service. They don't want any sense gratification at all. <clears throat> and so they'll eat very little, they eat very simple, sleep very little, sleep in a very, uh, on a hard floor. They won't take any material comforts like that. So you see, there's devotees like that, and there's devotees who are indifferent. And then there's, uh, there's uh, other devotees who want sense, who look forward to sense gratification. And if they don't get it, they feel, oh, what happened? <laughs> and those will stay in the material world. <laughs> Unless they give it up. They have, you have to come to at least being indifferent towards it. But being indifferent can also lead you to come back to being attached to it. So that's, that indifference has to be really fit, fixed in devotional service. <clears throat> in other words, <clears throat> I'm hungry. <clears throat> but here's somebody else who needs some food. So let me give it to them. Or oh, another person will think, let me eat first so I can uh, have energy so I can feed them. <laughs> and the other one will think, no, let me give them the food first because it's more important. So they're more renounced. <laughs> so you see all the different subtleties of renunciation. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that, yeah. It's good to take inventories to see why am I doing what am I doing? What is my motivation? Mm -hmm. Is the motivation some false ego? Or is actually, is it motivation to please Krishna? Mm. Okay. On the subject of renunciation, Guru Maharaj, I have a question about levels of renunciation and how to proceed in such a way that you're not, you know, uh, bhoga tyaga, bhoga tyaga, bhoga tyaga all the time. You either overeat or then you undereat. You overeat and undereat. Yeah, that's mentioned, yeah. So how we can proceed nicely so that we are giving it up naturally and we don't fall back again? You follow the process. One should not eat too much or eat too little, sleep too much or sleep too little. So you take what you need to keep body and soul together, that's all. Mm. If you overeat, you fall into the lower modes of passion and ignorance, and it becomes, the mind becomes clouded, and you can't really do your service nicely. Mm. If you undereat, the mind is not able to control itself, and then it wanders in different ways, and you can also can't focus, or you might even get angry if you under eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Oh, so there's a yeah. Of course, Prabhupada said one should eat like a yogi, half fill the stomach with food, one quarter with water, one quarter with air. Mm -hmm. Don't drink water before the meal. Don't drink water after the meal. Drink water during the meal. That's Ayurveda. And you don't drink, you sip. You sip the water, that gives, that gives some... Uh, helps to aid the digestion of the food. If you sip a little water, sip, you know, sip, not drink. 
And so if you eat, if you drink before, you, you cut down the fire of digestion, and if you drink after, you also, you know, destroy the fire of digestion. So one should sip water during the meal, and that's sufficient. You take it with the meal. <clears throat> and that's, that's a healthy way to, to do it. Yeah. How did we get on that? Oh, yeah, overeating. <laughs> you have to understand 